Student mic check. Student mic check. This is where she's going to probably do the intro. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.
might be live and I don't know. So, um, but before we move on with our seminar, uh, we have a little a presentation that we want to do before today's seminar. I'm going to turn it over um, to Ethan, and I'll hold the microphone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jennifer. <laughs> uh, I'm here today uh, wearing the cloak of authority as uh, director of the uh, School of Urban Studies and Planning, the Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, it's a really uh, wonderful thing and an honor to be able to present to Sumi Malik um, a certificate suitable for framing to express our congratulations to her for being named the Outstanding Transportation Student uh, this year here at Portland State University. So without further ado, I am going to uh, turn the seminar over to Scott Bricker. Yeah. Scott Bricker, Policy Director at the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, uh, talking about uh, a project that they've uh, recently completed. Uh, Scott, oh, I should also mention uh, that he is an alum of our program, the Masters of Urban Regional Planning Program, and so we're quite uh, happy to see him doing the great work he's doing now. Thank you. Uh, that is right. My name is Scott Bricker, and uh, sometimes also have a hard time saying my own name, and especially the Bicycle Transportation Alliance, where I work. So it's like two things. Um, I, it's great to be back. I am a Merp graduated in 98. And uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm required to stand right here. Normally, especially since there's no one in the first two rows, I would be attacking you all with hands-on presentations and East Coast-style um, you know, anyway, I will, I'll try and, you know, from back here, express my uh, enthusiasm and desire over the topics of bicycling and urban planning. Uh, and, oh, and also, I'm also not supposed to point to the screen, so I'll try, and, I'll try and not do that. Well, because of the Internet people. Hi, Internet people, by the way. Uh, if you are uh, joining us on the Internet, there's also, I want you to know that the BTA, I'm going to be passing out later, a uh, copy of our Blueprint for Better Bicycling, and you can go to the BTA's website. So you might want to do that now. Go to bta4bikes.org, uh, and that's number four. And on the, w on the front of our website, there'll be a download that you can uh, follow our presentation. So I'm going to start off not actually by talking about bikes, but um, let's see, how do I get this thing going? By talking about a book that I'm reading called The Source. So you want that on the screen. Yeah. All right, and then later when I want it back to the, uh, I go there. Okay, thank you. By James Mishner. Now, a fellow Jew, I think, uh, it's interesting to read the source, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is the source is really about uh, the maker, which is an area in, in Israel, now Israel, or you know, Mesopotamia, Nile, the Fertile Valley, the start of civilization, the start of, of urban planning, perhaps, the start of uh, the goal of having the, the, the Fertile Valley, the, the Crescent, the Promised Land. We'll go back to the computer, I think. And in the Promised Land, not only are there things like bicycles, but there's good customer service and small cars, uh, things that... You know, I will try and tie back what we're talking about today, uh, perhaps to those. I think that uh, I think urban planning, which I am a student of and continue to be a student of, transportation planning, bicycle planning, 
Uh, our goal as urban planning students is people who are trying to make the urban environments better. Uh, our goal is to create vibrant places, places that are good for people, good for economy, and actually economic development. We were just chatting, chatting with Ethan just before this. Economic development is a hu huge buzzword right now in transportation planning, but places where people can move around, where they can experience things. And Portland's well known for its urban planning. Uh, Back, uh, Oregon as well, back to the 70s, and we could talk a little bit about that. And it's not necessarily, and it can also be this, uh, which is one of my favorite slides, and I show this in a, a number of presentations. And, and sometimes, uh, as an urban planner and a bicyclist, I get you know, maybe a little depressed even when, when I think about this and when I think about um, where, where are things going. But luckily, I live in, in inner North Portland, and, and once in a while, Actually, probably every day as I get on my bike, but once in a while, have moments of encouragement. And in fact, had one this morning as I was riding uh, Bree, who's my girlfriend's uh, nine, almost 10-year-old, which is really important, to, almost 10, is nine and 11-month-year-old daughter to school this morning. And it was just a really fun process where we, uh, let me do a little flip of my page here where we got on our bike and loaded up the cargo that we had uh, and started moving, and we had an exploration. It was active. Uh, we got exercise, and we talked about stuff. We talked about other bikes and the Willamette River that was flooding as we rode over the, uh, over, over the Broadway Bridge. And this building that's being constructed that we ride by, or Angela rides by her mother every day on the way to school. And we talked about how buildings are constructed. And every day we get to see the building being constructed piece by piece. Today we saw a piece of a wall moving. It was really, it was fun. Uh, we got a chance to breathe the fresh air. We got a chance to get exercise. And we actually got rained on, which was neat. And we just liked it. We just had a good time. And I dropped her off to school, and, and then I rode back, and I was like, i, I got to talk about this bike ride today in my presentation. And in fact, the nice thing about bicycle issues is that every day I can talk about a new adventure that I've had. On my experience, like riding up here, I had a chance to, uh, and if I guess maybe the internet people, you could, if you could just put it on me now for a couple of seconds instead of the uh, screen in me. Uh, uh, riding here, uh, I rode here in the suit, and I love riding in a suit. Riding in a suit is one of the most empowering things you could do. I suggest it sometime. Get in your cocktail dress or your suit and ride your bike, and everyone looks at you, and they're like, wow, that's a pretty stylish biker. And then you could even cut people off sometimes, and they don't <laughs> think that you know, you're some punk. But no, seriously, um, I, I think it's, it's possible. It's possible for us to build uh, you know, whatever kind of society we want, and that's part of what the BTA uh, is, is hoping to do. We, um, we took a trip, a group of us, a contingent from Oregon, from Portland, took a trip to the Netherlands uh, it, last year, late last year, and we just had a great time. And we saw a place that, um, that's a successful place, you know, a place that started the Royal Dutch Shell Company, a place that those people basically built New York and founded New York, uh, a place of people who are smart and economically savvy, uh, who have the fourth largest port in Europe, who have the fourth largest airport in Europe, and basically one of the centers of economy, knows about you know, not worldwide economy. I mean, this kind of central part of Europe is, is really huge. I mean, it is booming, even though, of course, Asia and the US are other uh, important aspects. But not only that, is that this is a place where people are they're, they're sensible. I mean, their, their infrastructure is in great shape, and they ride their bikes, if you can believe that, which, of course, I think is sensible. But in fact, 40% of the people in the Netherlands ride their bikes or walk. They, they, they put those two statistics together. Uh, that's 40% of the trips are bicycling and walking trips. 50% are car trips, and then there's about 10% which are transit trips. But the difference between 88% car, 92% car, 96% car, depending on where you are in different metro regions or around, around the US, just the 50% as opposed to 90% is, is a huge difference. And it makes all the difference in how their, their society works. And again, at the same time, these are people who, they're, they're functioning in everyday life where kids ride their bike to school even behind 
giant people eating tractors. Um, I, this was like this weird scene, um, and you know they they these are people who are successful who one day ride their BMW drive their BMW and the next day j- jump on their thirty dollar bike in their suit and they ride to a dinner affair. It's anyway. So the BTA where I work for the Bicycle Transportation Alliance is a, a statewide nonprofit organization, and our goal is to basically make Portland like Amsterdam or to at least increase bicycling in Oregon and Portland and to educate people on how to, on bicycling and to make it safe and to make it fun and to make it something that people want to do. We work with children. We work with adults. We're, we're working with PSU. We give presentations, public information, lobbying, advocacy, kind of the whole gamut. We have 4,000 members, and we're actually a pretty powerful grassroots organization. Kind of the lowly bike group has actually some, some pull around here, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, at the same time, and we can go back to the screen here. At the same time, you know, we have today's front page newspaper story, and we'll put this at the document camera. The Uneasy Riders front page of Oregonian, for those of you who read the Oregonian. And uh, interesting, interesting times. You know, there's people who bicycling has tripled in the last 10 years in Portland, and at the same time, people are you know, there, there's, this, there's this issue, you know, are bicyclists good? Are they bad? How does it interact? Um, so we're, we think that bicycling can triple again, but not only in 10 years, I think in three years, in five years. And we also think that it can be done in a way that would improve customer relationships, you know, that would make people generally feel good about what's going on, might be able to actually reduce congestion, improve the economy. So in the quest for this, we decided, uh, well, actually, you know, one day we had a, let's put back on the computer here. Uh, we had a conversation with um, ex-city commissioner Jim Francisconi, and he asked us, what do you guys want? And what's, what do you want? We said, more bike lanes. Well, okay, but what, what do you want? What projects do you want? Uh, we want more bike racks. Well, we, do you want first street or second street and third? You know, what, what projects? What are your top projects? And we said, hmm. Now, I don't know if we actually know what our top projects are. And this launched an effort for us, uh, and this is where I'm going to hand stuff out. Um, let me see where I am here. So this is where people on the Internet, uh, let's see if we can hand this out, thanks, uh, would go to the BTA website and download the Blueprint for Better Bicycling, which on the BTA website actually looks like this, um, so it's it's blue, uh, so it's on the front page, and you could download a PDF. And in fact, I have original copies of this if anyone wants. We have a limited number, so if you want one, just come up and see me after, and I'd be happy to give you one. I have about 10 or 12 of these. We decided to create a blueprint for better bicycling, which is what I handed out to you. Um, and uh, you know you can flip through it and you're like, okay, yeah, uh, let's see, Blueprint for Better Bicycling. Well, I know those two people on the front cover. That's Jessica Roberts, the Portland Metro Area Advocate, and Robert Ping, Safe Routes the School Director, and you open it up. And, well, those are just some volunteers, and there's Scott, the guy who's talking right now. And, and then you kind of, okay, and, there's some, and then there's this woman on the back, and actually that's Angela, and she's sitting in the back. Thanks, Angela, for coming. Um, and so, and, oh, great, you know, some pictures and ni- nice report. And everyone says, great report, Scott, good job. I said, but did you read it? You know, and and so I'm not. You know, I don't expect that you've read it that fast, uh, unless you're my ninth grade social studies teacher who was a speed reader and it was very cool, or Matt Damon in that really good movie. Um, what was that called again? Goodwill Hunting. Yes, thank you. And that was very cool too. Uh, but there's some good stuff in here. So what I'd like to do is talk about what's in here a little bit, uh, and try and. Um, get you guys engaged, actually. Because the way that we started this process, and it was about a two-year process, has anyone heard me talk about this before in a different class? Okay, maybe I could, like, I don't, like, some of this is the same, so maybe, you know, we can send you on an errand or something. No, just, if you have, a, if you have any, if I did something better last time than this time, just let me know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'm trying to be funny, but I'm being silly. So we uh, spent two years on this project, and we realized Two years is a long time, but we also figured that to understand, to create a blueprint for better bicycling, we didn't want to just 
create a document that said, well, here's the way we've been doing business, and so let's put out a report that says, here's the projects that we most need. Um, we said, we have to really figure out what's going to increase bicycling in, in Oregon. And so what we actually did was we started a process. We, uh, the, the first thing we did was we put an, an online survey together. We had over 900 people respond, which is very significant, statistically significant results. Uh, Two-thirds of them were BTA members, which means that they're regular cyclists or supporting, supportive. Uh, and then one-third, we don't know who they were. But we figured most of the people, kind of a self-selected bicyclist survey. So realize that as we talk about it. Uh, we also formed a cabinet, and Jennifer, thank you for serving on that, a cabinet of folks that included Jennifer and Mia Burke, who also teaches here, and, and a number of other folks, uh, some political folks and whatnot. And we, and we had our BTA team, and we did some, we went and gave a presentation. So we did this whole thing before about a year worth of work before we really put together our projects or we put together what our blueprint was going to be. So what I thought I would do was ask you folks here what you would want to do. I mean, where would you like to ride? And so maybe we'll start there. And I should got to keep a watch on my time here, or look at my watch. Is there? And I need to remind people because we are webcasting. When you speak and participate, uh, push the button on the microphone. Hopefully, that's in front of you, so that people watching on the web can hear what you have to say. Okay. So, um, I guess. Uh, well. You know, I, I understand that really the one thing that we missed in here was the word rain. Um, and we probably should have said sun. You know, we need sun to ride our bikes. But besides that, I guess maybe I'll just start off by asking you guys some questions again. This is where I would really come and try and interact with you guys. But I'll stay put. Um, raise your hand, and I'll try and report for the web viewers of what the results are generally. Oh, the cameras will look that way. So raise your hands and keep them up. Have you ridden your bike in the last five years or a bike in the last five years? So and basically, most everyone here. And if you haven't, that's OK, too, because it means that you're probably interested. Now keep them up. Now have you ridden, ridden, ridden a bike in the last two years? OK, still most people, but some people haven't. The last year, um, since the summer, like the last summer. And OK, how about today? So a couple, and we still, and we actually have a nice number of people. So thank you for riding your bikes today. You freed up a parking space for someone else, um, and you know you saved all awesome health care costs. So most people here at least have ridden their bikes in the last five years. Have ridden bikes in the last five years, so have some experience. And if you haven't, maybe you've ridden your bike. Um, you know, you, you remember what it was like. Uh, so the next question is, where do you ride your bike, or where do you like to ride your bike? How about Where's your favorite place to ride? So you can give me the exact location, or you can give me the type of place. But let me know this is where we'll go to the audience. Let's see some hands, and then just, you know, if you have your hand up, just go for it. So come on. With, yeah. Uh, large Mountain. Okay, yeah, I'll say. Large Mountain. Large Mountain. Okay, so Large Mountain is like a mountain biking? Actually, I like to, I'm a road bike uh, rider, so I, I ride um, up the, I don't, I'm not sure, what, is it called Large Mountain Road? Okay, yeah. Kind of a nice low traffic uphill and then downhill kind of a road. All right. Uh, I saw a hand in the back. Microphone. Um, like trails and, and specifically uh, the Marine Drive Trail just because there's less crossings than the spring water, for example. Okay. Who else? We need at least five or six more people to say. Yeah. Um, well, I'm a commuter bike rider, and I don't actually get out in nature very much to ride my bike, but so I think my favorite place to ride my bike is uh, late at night when there's like a lot, very little traffic on the roads and it's, it's very peaceful. Yeah, we had an experience like that last night and it was really nice. You get to ride in the middle and great. Um, yeah, so I hand the back. Um, I said the Leaf Erickson Trail in Forest Park. So that's kind of a, a gravel road, right? Not, not hardcore mountain biking, but nice recreational. Yeah. Oh, it's steep. Okay. I haven't done that in a while, actually. I should probably do that. Who else? I see an, a head nod. How about, you got any place for us? I guess similar to the other ones, although I like the loop where you take uh, Spring Water Corridor up I-205 and then down the Columbia River. Okay. Uh, so it's a combination of several trails, but a real nice loop around the east side. All right, thanks. Who else? I mean, maybe people who ride their bike on a daily basis. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I like my the north and northeast neighborhoods. 
Okay. Do you have any roads you specifically like, or is it? Probably Shaver. Shaver's pretty nice. Okay. So you live up there and you ride down. All right. Can you actually, can you, do you ever commute to PSU, or you're, you're a student, right? Can you see that? Yeah, I, do. I, I usually just bike around my neighborhood and take the bus down. Okay. Um, I'll, we'll get back to that. Yeah. Um, I saw a raccoon last night on Shaver riding my bike home. A raccoon? Get a little, and you don't actually kill it, but you actually get to enjoy it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, I work at Metro and I take classes here, and I have a great bike ride for Metro here. Practically, most of it is along the river and across the bridges, and then a little bit of downtown uh, riding with one really steep hill, but it's a, good, it's a great commute. So you're able to basically hook onto the either the Esplanade or the waterfront trail right from, PS, from Metro? Yeah, I just get on the steel bridge and then cross the river there and then go along the Esplanade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anyone else want to give us? You know, we were supposed to take the next hour and a half, so. You know. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll pry a little bit further into that. But so, I, I mean, are there themes? What, what themes did anyone hear in, that, in, in the discussion of where we like to bike? It's not where we necessarily bike, but where we like to bike. Um, any themes? Yeah. Oh. Serenity. Is that what you said? Okay, so serenity, meaning, uh, give us a couple more adjectives there. Quiet, nice, peaceful. Okay. Nature-based. Yeah, thanks. Uh, reduced potential conflict with cars. Okay. So that was a theme, is not, you know, having a place where you're not necessarily around cars, but you're either on a trail or at night. Or minimize the number of times that you have to cross the street or the mm -hmm. odds of a car passing you by. Like yeah. Okay. Uh, I saw another hand go up. Did. Okay. Do you have anything else to say? <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah. So we had some themes there, and uh, and this was, of course, maybe not a statistically significant sample, unless you want to say of this class, but of of the metro area, probably not. Uh, but we heard some themes. Um, now, I wanted to ask you, and I don't remember your name, even though I said it only once and I've never met you, but what were the reasons why you decide to not commute downtown? And you can give us a variety, but what, you know, as opposed to just riding around northeast Portland. Um, I think probably cars and having to deal with traffic. So okay. I'm fairly, I'm kind of a new cyclist. So. so what's the difference between downtown and... Northeast Portland, or or the pro the approaches to downtown. It might just be that I know my neighborhood better than I know downtown. Okay, so part of it might be a cognitive thing. It's actually what your head feels comfortable with, and what you know. And I can give a whole other spiel on cognitive issues, but I'll try not to. But and part of it might be a reality, which is you know downtown, you know there's more traffic downtown, or in the process on Broadway to reach the Broadway Bridge and you don't feel comfortable with going there. Do you think that there's a possibility in your life that whether it was shepherded by someone or whatnot that you could do it? Uh, yeah, I, I tend to, I'll bike down here if I have people to come down here with. Okay. So otherwise I tend to ride the bus. That's pretty reasonable. Uh, I, I saw a hand back there and then I'll come over back. Yeah, um, yesterday evening I rode from campus up to um, the PDC building on Fifth Ave at Davis, I think, uh -huh. and um, it was great because unlike riding here, which is all uphill and a little bit slower than the uh, the vehicle, the motor vehicles, going um, up to Davis, it was downhill, and I was right on pace with the cars, and there was enough traffic where cars weren't able to pass me, and I was just like another motor vehicle on the ride down, and I was taking up my lane. And so you were actually riding in the lane, taking the full lane of traffic? And you were going the speed of cars? Yeah, because, and, of, because of the amount of traffic that there was at the time. And uh, because of the amount of traffic. And there's also the traffic signals downtown are actually timed. I think it's 12 miles an hour. So the bike, it's, it's timed with a bicyclist in mind, in fact. So I ride usually either whether it's uphill or downhill, except on some of the most steep approaches like Broadway or whatnot. I'm usually able to keep pace. Sometimes I break a sweat. Sometimes I don't. Um, and yeah, you could take a full lane downtown. However, many people, most people who aren't daily cyclists, and I think we're hearing this a little bit, don't necessarily feel comfortable with the process of taking a lane in a downtown environment. 
And in fact, that's one of the things we heard, and I'll go into more about what we heard, but we're covering a lot of them anyway, so it'll be review when I go into what we heard. Uh, yeah? If you think about it, there are very few um, bike lanes downtown. Uh, uh, from the waterfront up, I think you have to go all the way, you know, all the way to Broadway before you get to something north-south. And not only that, but in the recent years with the development of streetcar, which we love, of course, um, there's also been a constricting of some of the once bicycle lanes like Love or routes like Lovejoy because of tracks. And tracks, especially wet tracks, are, are particularly hazardous for cyclists. Um, and so that's one of the, So there's actually, in some ways, there's been an improvement. In some ways, there's been a, a shrinkage in, in downtown environments. Uh, anyone else? So I think actually what we heard from this class is pretty much what we heard from our survey. And that survey, again, recognized were cyclists. These were people who either were either BTA members, or we don't know what a third of them were, but at least 600 people were cyclists of some sorts. We, the, we heard, and actually, um, this is when we could open up the report. On page three, the themes and challenges. So. Uh, we heard the first thing that we heard, the most clear thing we heard from people, and you can take away as a potential urban planner or someone who might advocate or someone who might, whatever, you know, however you're going to interact with, with bicycling, is that bicycling around cars is not a good fit. People just don't like it. People are concerned. And I can bike on, I feel comfortable basically biking on any street, virtually. Um, but although sometimes when I go into certain environments where I ride in Portland and I go into another place, a location where they don't see as many cyclists, I get treated differently than on the same very similar type of street. And I don't like riding in places where people are yelling at me and honking. But, I know, you know, but even I, my favorite rides are the low traffic streets. I like riding on, my, some of my favorite streets are like Southeast Ankeny Street or riding through Lads Edition or the Esplanade. Um, and people felt that way. The single most thing to remember is that people and biking around cars, they don't really match. So even though in Beaverton on 185th Avenue, there are bike lanes, it's a five lane roadway and people don't ride on it. So we think that having bicycle lanes in a variety of facility types is important and we can go into that a little bit, just like there are different types of automobile ways. There's you know, expressways or freeways, and there's highways, and there's arterials, and collectors, and neighborhood streets. There could be a hierarchy, or you can consider that in a bicycle infrastructure. Um, focusing on routes that would take people away from cars is a good way to get people, families, and other and riding their bikes. So uh, we also heard some other things that make sense, like complete routes. So if the bike lane ends, you know, if the road ended, you couldn't continue to drive. I mean, it's kind of the same thing with a bicyclist. It's a lot of times the bicycle lane ends. There's a place where, you know, you've been riding bike lanes and you enter downtown and there are no bike lanes. Or you feel, so there, there's, discon there's, there's disconnects. I feel comfortable riding in Northeast Portland, but I don't want to ride downtown because it's, you know, busy. Uh, there's no bike lanes. And, that, and we hear that all the time. Um, motorist behavior is an issue that was talked about in today's Oregonian story a little bit. Um, and I think that, it, you know, my experience is that the, cl the more that you ride around other cyclists, the better motorists are around you. So if you're in Northeast Portland or Southeast Portland, most people are bicyclists. They know bicyclists or kids could be biking at any moment. And they treat you a little bit better than someone who is in a community that doesn't have any cyclists. And that's actually, there's been research that's shown safety in numbers. The more bicyclists in a certain area, the safer bicyclists are. So Portland bicycling has tripled the accident rate has gone down because accidents have stayed flat, and so the accident rate has gone significantly down, or crashes, call them crashes. And then finally, the quality of facilities. Uh, you know, the road's bad, is there, are there junk in the bike lanes, whatnot. So the next page of the report, so this is page four and five, uh, we kind of stole some concepts from Roger Geller, Geller at the city of Portland 
Uh, but we also co-developed them, and we developed them at the, without knowing that he had developed them already. So it was one of those things. We, we did give him credit in the report, and every time I talk about it. But this pie chart and this graph are really two things that we feel like has changed our advocacy, from putting bike lanes on Broadway to saying, boy, you know, there's 1% or less than 1%. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's 1% or less than 1% of, uh, of bicyclists who will ride under any conditions. And I might be one of those. But if you take 100 people or 200 people, maybe only one is going to ride on the, the busy street in Beaverton or wherever, and the other 199 aren't. So we have to look at what are those other 199? What will they want to bike? What can we get them to do? We know in Holland everyone bikes, or in Netherlands. You know why are they so much different culturally? Sure, but um, there's another group that we consider the B cyclists, or seven percent of the of the population, people who bicycle, but have some concerns. So they bicycle in Northeast Portland. They don't bicycle downtown. Sorry, I keep on going back to that example, but it's a, it's exactly what we see. You know, in, in bicycling. Uh, they bicycle in certain places and they have concerns in certain places. They, they, you know, they want to bike with their families, but they only feel comfortable riding on, on, a, on a trail. They don't want to ride in a busy street. And that makes a lot of sense. And then there's this other group, the sea cyclists, which is the majority of the population, which they don't really cycle. They think cycling's fine. Maybe bicyclists get in their way once in a while in, in, around cars, but I actually think the people who don't like bicyclists probably are like maybe more the D group. This kind of maybe, you know, they don't necessarily not like cyclists, but this group of the C, you know, they, when they go to Sun Rivers, everyone, the people know Sun River Resort. Basically, I see a lot of head nods. You go to Sun River with your family and you drive there with the cars on the bike rack and you don't get in your car again because there's a whole network of bike trails that connect to the town and the pool and the horseback riding and maybe if you're going golfing you know you drive to the golf course but you don't need to drive the whole time and people don't they're on vacation you know they don't want to have to get in the car and load the family up and and whatnot and you know and you see in places People go to Oregon State Parks on the coast, and you always see these pop-up RVs, whatnot, and they have bikes on the back. And these are people who are not biking, probably, any other day of the week. So they, they enjoy biking. It's a possibility. They probably walked or biked to kids uh, to school when they were a kid. In fact, statistics say 66% of kids in 1970 biked and walked to school, and 10% do today. So these are people who've had some experience with it. You know, their kids bike around the suburban neighborhoods or whatnot, but they have serious concerns about bicycling and traffic. So what are some of the solutions that we have? Well, our major recommendation is to, hey, let's go with the flow. You know, let's create a series of low traffic bicycle ways. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that, uh, a little bit more time, and this is where I'll go back to the computer, the slide presentation thingy. Oops. Um, I just like that picture. This is a, a Netherlands picture. It's kind of blurry, but the one thing I liked about the Netherlands is that people in the Netherlands, like, I saw this great, my, my favorite, my, the one guy who I showed you with the kids, that was my favorite. Well, the second favorite was this couple. It was a Saturday night. The guy was in a tux. The woman was in this cocktail dress. It was a nice night. The guy was riding the bike. The woman was sitting side saddle like this woman is. And, you know, they were in their 50s or something, and they, you know they had a BMW in the garage, and they just decided to do that this night. But, oh, uh-oh. Well, that didn't really. Oh, uh, was it a movie? No, I guess it was just a TIFF image. Okay, well, we don't see some pictures sometimes. Um, so, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on the low traffic bicycle streets. And the reason why I want to spend some time on it is this is one of our major campaigns coming out of this blueprint for better bicycling. Um, and the reason why we like this campaign, besides the fact that people want to ride in these kinds of streets and they already exist in Portland, is that in the current day and age, and I kind of want to go off on a, another tangent, which is about the economics of transportation, which are, there's 
not only is our infrastructure old and falling apart, and we don't have the current funding to just repair our infrastructure, there's traffic congestion everywhere, there's all these needs, we need to build a new bridge over I-5, there's all, you know, everything. You know, we have so many transportation demands to not even build our way out of congestion, just to like operate, that we, we have a third of the money to even just operate in the next 20 years. And at the same time, you know, we're saying, well, we need to build this whole new bicycle infrastructure. So one of the things that people in transportation planning, the successful people I think moving forward, will also try and understand how can we get the best value? Where do we get the best bang for our buck? How do we get the most people bicycling with the least amount of money? Use existing streets, and especially in a gridded network like Portland, where we say, and this already exists as you can see, you know, hey, we're going to set a designated network, and we call them bicycle boulevards, of bicycle ways or bicycle boulevards that would be low traffic, they would go through, they would connect, and you can ride your bike on them, feel comfortable, feel safe, and you could actually get places. And there are places like this. Um, we think that there is an existing network of neighborhood streets, um, and I'm going to show you just some kind of design stuff uh, that currently exists in Portland. Oh, the two pictures that didn't show up were Berkeley has a bicycle boulevard program, and while it misses some components I think are really important, they've done some really nice stuff, and I wanted to show you some of their images, but um, you're not going to see those. So Portland has already done some nice stuff. This is uh, Clinton uh, in southeast Portland at 39th. You know, a place that has potential hazard, a place that bicyclists don't want to ride. Now, Clinton, as you can see from the screen, as you're going east on Clinton from 39th to 40th and 50th and so on, not only is there what's called a bicycle box, so a bicyclist can get ahead of the cars if there are any cars at the stoplight, but only bicyclists can go through this traffic light. Now, this basically means that not that cars aren't allowed on that street, but it means that cars won't use this as a through route. And why should they? Because Division's right next door, and Powell's right on the other side. You know, Division's just north of Clinton, and Powell's just south of Clinton. And these are fine streets for automobiles. And, you know, and, and one of the things that we're going to start to say is we might have to give up some of those streets. We don't want to give up Division, but we know if there's going to be a bicycle highway, it's not going to be on Division. It's going to be on Clinton, right south of it. And a lot of people who ride in southeast Portland ride on Clinton, or Lincoln and Harrison, or Ankeny. The three, and they, they don't have bike lanes. They're, I mean, bike lanes are important in downtown places and whatnot, but in this environment, if there are no cars, who cares about bike lanes? You know, it's like, it, it, it's about the cars, it's not about the bike lanes. And so in this environment, a bicyclist goes through, cars can't, and there's very few cars on this street because they don't have through access. And then on the other side, this car coming, this green Audi who's traveling west, can't go straight either on Clinton. So it has to turn north or south on 39th. And so therefore, Clinton Street is a great bicycling street in some ways because of this one intersection. I mean, it's, besides that, it's a neighborhood collector, like any other neighborhood collector. But this one intersection prevents through traffic from using it as a true neighborhood collector. So people who are driving to the Clinton business district on 26 and Clinton can't drive down Clinton. They have to take division and, you know, and turn or whatnot. And then Clinton uh, then connects nicely into Ladd's Edition and some other nice places. Um, this is the other one. This is through Ladd's Edition, Lincoln and Harrison, looking east out of, uh, uh, I guess this is, I don't know which one comes first. I think this is Link Harrison. And this is 20, 20th Avenue or 21st Avenue. Similar thing. Um, there's basically a median, and you can see just to the right of the median, or I guess it's, yeah, the right, there's a little gap. That's another gap that only bicyclists can go through. Um, actually, this is, I'm sorry, this is looking west. Um, but the point is, is that, that that one piece of pavement prevents cars from going through, and this is one of the most popular bicycle routes in the city, I mean, hands down. There's go, you know, this is how people from the Hawthorne district, south of Hawthorne, get to downtown or get to where they're going. No real bicycle facilities. They have those little white dots on them now that the city put in and, and some signs. If they're not up yet, they will be. But it's this one, one piece of infrastructure. And then at 39th, there's another one that makes this a bicycle street. 
And the fact is, is that the people who live on that street, and you can't see it, I'll move back, but the people who live in Lad's Edition, I mean, I don't live in Lad's Edition, but they must love this. I mean, one of the reasons why people move to the suburbs anyway, I mean, they're better schools perhaps, but because they didn't want, you know, they wanted a place where kids can play in the street and it kind of feels like a neighborhood. You, your kids can play in the street because there are no cars in the street. Um, so this is something that we think has public appeal and is low cost. Uh, another one that the city of Portland did um, in northeast Portland, actually, on failing in, I think this is 13th, around this school, uh, you can see that bicyclists can enter and there's a one-way environment. So there are some things, let's just see what we have here. Now this is, this is kind of the next piece. So um, there are some basic things that we're promoting, the concept of a bicycle boulevard, which we can say we can take a very small amount of money, maybe $50,000, and make a bicycle highway in the city of Portland. And we can do this, we think we should do one every year. And we think in five years we should have five or ten new bicycle highways all through Portland on low traffic streets, Commercial Street, Shaver, Skidmore, Mason, Failing. You know, there's a whole slew of them. And then there's some obstacles. You have to cross major streets, and that's where some of the costs can increase. But you could use existing traffic lights and tie into those kinds of things. So our blueprint is founded in this concept. And uh, we are rolling out a Bicycle Boulevards campaign, and we are hoping to build at least one every year. Uh, yeah, question in the back. Make sure you're here. Are you distinguishing Bicycle Highway from Bicycle Boulevard? No, I, I use them interchangeably. Sorry. I just think that it's like the trail that goes from Omsi to Selwood along the Willamette River is effectively a bicycle highway. I mean, on the summer Saturday, that thing is congested. It needs to be twice as wide as it is. So I was, I was just referring, I mean, I was just a reference. Thanks for clarifying. Um, but I, I do think that, uh, you know, trails is, of course, another way to do the same thing. However, to build a trail costs a lot of money. So while we support regional trails in a big way, and in fact, we're interested in getting regional trails as part of a an hopefully upcoming bond measure that Metro is looking at doing, a $220 million bond measure, there are six designated greenways, and we advocate through the federal transportation planning process for trails and whatnot. We think they're great, and in fact, it's one of the things, especially in the suburbs, that will get pe give people access to good bicycling. Within the city of Portland, within gridded districts, we already have the infrastructure. We just need to do some small fixes. So um, the, uh, the other, looking at the blueprint, back to the blueprint. Um, let's see, how is my time? We have to 1.30 is the supposed time, or is it 1.15? 1.30. So I'll try and wrap this up soon so we can have a discussion or, or leave early. Um, the, uh, uh, as we go through, we have four major solutions. One are increased uh, the user base, and we're talking about, under number two, low traffic streets, as I just went on and on and on about. Um, and, you know, bicycle lanes, of course, is a tool for major roadways, especially when you're expanding roads. It's easy to put those in. And roads now, by design, would have shoulders anyway. So a bicycle lane could be basically a striped shoulder. Even though bicyclists have different rights in a bicycle lane, it's, it's a place that, in an emergency, automobiles do pull over in the bicycle lane. And, you know, in an emergency, I don't think too many bicyclists are too worried, you know, uh, kind of a thing. We also put out some solutions for the suburbs. Uh, so I'm going to flick off this page pretty soon, so internet viewers know that. Uh, we have four ideas that we came up with that were not necessarily endorsed by the advocates in the suburbs, which is the people who ride the bikes and, and their bikes in the suburbs most often are people who are the type A cyclists. I mean, the people who have been riding their bikes for the last 20 years, and it's great, and we love you guys. And but we, we're moving on. We're trying to build a network for the type B and type C cyclists, for the families, for people who want low traffic streets. And we have four ideas. Um, one is using shared use paths, which is already very popular. Um, and, and like, for example, on the west side, the power line trail, uh, the west side power line trail, all the, basically Washington County and all the Washington County cities are very excited about that and they're looking for money all over the place for that. So there's a lot of excitement. There's 
other, you know, I think Forest Grove wants to do a ring bicycle trail, and people are talking about bicycling in the wine country. There's a lot of support for this kind of thing as an economic development tool. But we also think that the low traffic network, and I'll go into that a little bit more in the suburbs, is a possibility, a low cost possibility. Safe routes to school, which is the concept of increasing bicycling walking to school, starting in a place where kids still go to neighborhood schools in the, su in the suburbs a lot of the times. And it is possible for kids to bike and walk to school in a targeted fashion with support. And then potentially campuses and centers. So urban campuses, you know, play, you know anyway, that, that's a little bit more, I think, of a stretch in some ways, but important. Uh, this is a picture of kids bicycling. Um, I think it might be last edition, it might be the suburbs, but this is the kind of thing that you could see in the suburbs. And I want to go through some, a little bit of discussion about bicycling in the suburbs, and I'm going to show mostly schools because I think it's a good starting point because it's a real destination because studies have shown that 20 to 25 percent, these are Californian studies, of morning traffic is taking kids places. When I rode Bree to school this morning, there were two bikes in the bike rack. Hers and someone else's. It was a rainy morning. Well, we actually got sun, luckily. But there are often five or six bikes. But on the road, on Gleason Street, <clears throat> you know, the major uh, collector slash arterial street in northwest Portland, there were lots of cars, and many of them were parents taking kids to basically this magnet school. It's a good school. Um, and I don't blame parents for taking kids. And in fact, a lot of the parents were carpooling and driving hybrids, and and and, and you know, and that's very important because if there weren't parents carpooling, there would be three times as many cars as there were in that street in that 45-minute window. But the fact is, is that dr that street gets congested during that time, um, and it's possible that to target schools is a real way to decrease morning traffic. Um, this is a suburban school community. This is the kind of thing that we can do with a low, in a low-cost manner for future schools, future developments, but also retrofit in the suburbs. This is a neighborhood. neighborhood. Behind this beige stone house, you can't see it, but there are two schools, a high school and elementary school. If a kid had to walk or get transported to this school without this path I'm about to show you where the sign is, uh, where the pedestrian sign is, they would have to go out onto effectively a country road with no shoulders, high speed, 45 mile an hour road, and they would never ever be able to walk to school. Their parents would not let them, you know, and maybe some parents would walk with their kids to school, but many wouldn't. However, these kids have this nice little cut through, which turns into this, and then turns into this. And the elementary school is basically to the right, and this path leads to the high school. Now, any kid can do that. And you know there is some concern is there stranger danger or whatnot. And this is a safe neighborhood in the suburban community. And this is very possible. But what's important, and a lot of schools are are not doing this, is that the school will be willing to open up their school grounds from five, seven, ten different points, so that kids can enter and they don't have to walk all the way around. And I'll show you another example. This is a school in Hillsboro. These are both Hillsboro schools. You can see a fairly new development behind this school. There, a lot of schools would have a fence around the entire school, and you would not be able to walk or bike to that school. This school has this opening that kids know about, and then you have these kids walking to school. It's pretty simple. You know, take out six sheets of chain link fence, and then you have all these kids who can walk to school. And what, if you're a parent, you know, and you see the school from your house, and there's a baseball field in between you and the school, it's like, get your butt on the baseball field and walk to school. I mean, maybe they're doing it and maybe they're not, but there's a lot of potential there. And we think that in the suburban communities, there's a lot of potential to create those low-cost solutions, and that's really what we're looking for. We don't know, we don't really think that right now we can just go out and change the, the nature of Beaverton, but we can do things like this to provide access to starting at the schools and then going to bike paths and maybe even, hopefully, town centers one day, which who knows if that will happen. Um, I have one other anecdotal story before I try and wrap up my presentation about the suburbs, um, which you know, I, I do have to say I don't spend lots of time in. So I know that this is something we haven't gotten very far. and We would like to engage suburban advocates in this process. We went out and talked to a number of bike shop owners. And there was one guy who just moved his shop to north of Highway 26 
um, pretty far, you know, like around 185th. I forget the names of the road that went right past the shop. It was a new shopping mall, the center with a, you know, whatever, a big box store and a lot of other small stores. And we talked to him, got into a conversation. We asked him if he rode his bike. And he said, yeah, I rode my bike. And this is a bike shop owner, so hopefully he does. And, and we asked him about his route. And he's told us about his route. And he kind of let out of the bag. I didn't even think about asking him how that it took him six months, the first six months when he bought his store and moved his store location, six months to figure out the route that he now uses of trying every day. And we said, well, you know, there's a bike map, you know, can't you just use that? He says, well, yeah, I can, but the bike map puts me on the major street, and even though there's a bike lane in some places and there's not in other places, I don't want to ride that like the rest of us here today as we talked. And so it took him six months to piece together designated bikeways that are on bike maps and neighborhood streets and neighborhood routes and a, a whole amalgamation of street of road types to figure out the most pleasant way for him to get to, to his job. Most people don't have that commitment, dedication, willingness to, fig, to spend six months figuring out their bike route to work. I mean, it would take a bike shop owner to really do that. And there's a lot of potential to identify that route. Like if we identified his route and put big bike stencils on, and that was one of the things in the Berkeley side I wanted to show you, is that with these routes, it's not only good enough to just have them, but we need to have them be very clear. This is a bike street. You will see bikes there. We like street stencils. We like markings on the ground. In addition to signs, um, bicyclists look on the ground a lot more than they're looking for the street sign. There's a lot of research about street clutter and whatnot. We think that if his route was marked as a route, that a lot more people might choose one day to get on their bike and try it. Um, but currently, those folks, most of the folks, and it's a cognitive thing, as we talked about, People cognitively, they don't know how long it's going to take. They think it's going to be a lot harder than it might be, and they don't know the safe routes. And if there were a network of them and they were clearly identified using existing networks, we think we can actually, in five years, in ten years, build an entirely new system of bicycle ways. And so it's an ambitious plan, but what the hey, especially if you're taking two years to put together your report. So you thumbing through the rest of the report, and I'll just show this... Um, Really quick, we have a map um, that shows the first 28 projects, I think, out of 40. We have a list of 40 projects that we think are the top 40. Uh, the Stellwood Bridge came in as the actual number one project of, I think, 90-something people of the 900 said Selwood Bridge was the biggest problem. It connects to so many communities. It connects to trails along the river. People want to be able to go over the Selwood Bridge. Um, we have a top 10 list. You can see this little icon, the 10 icon. Uh, otherwise, they're not numbered in a preference order. They're numbered in just sort of a geographic order. We sort of start, we start in the center, and we uh, go around like this. So, you know, one, we did start with the Selwood Bridge because we thought it was pretty central and it was the top project. We have um, the Central City Bicycle Plan. There needs to be a Central City Bicycle Plan update, and we heard that already from folks here. People don't like riding downtown, and people don't like getting here. They need to have access from the west um, and access from other places, and that's an important thing for us. We want to update the B Portland's Bicycle Master Plan, but we also want to work with the suburbs and doing some of the things I was talking about uh, on the low-cost solutions. And then we have a list of other tra of projects that we think are important including enforcement, uh, which we think is very important, some of the safe routes to school stuff I had mentioned. And we even, in number 40, have an Oregon Bicycling and Walking uh, Institute or center, which we hope one day will be housed here at PSU and we'll have the best research in the world on bicycle advocacy and try all sorts of new funky stuff out and have these discussions every day over lunch. So um, that's, uh, that's the report, and I wanted to thank... You know, we have a list. I want to thank everyone who participated, including Jennifer and our cabinet and anyone who took the survey and anyone who worked on it. Uh, so we have a half hour, and we can talk about stuff. I could definitely talk for a half hour more, but you know, I'd rather open it up for a conversation. And uh, thanks for showing up, especially if it wasn't required for you to do so. so. remember to use the microphone pushing where it says touch so people can hear your questions. Yeah. I wanted to ask about your um, your annual operating budget. 
and what it's looked like over the last few years of its growing and um, and where did most of those funds come from? Do they all come from donations or? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I'll give you a little bit more info just about the BTA generally. Uh, we were founded in 1991 in the way a lot of things are in a, in a, a living room. Uh, and the first project we worked on was getting bike racks and TriMet buses, which they now all have. Um, so even though the bad publicity TriMets unfortunately got recently, they've been really good partner for us. We hope to work with them. Uh, we now have over 4,000 members. We were originally a Portland group. We're now a statewide group. We're, uh, we're funded, the 4,000 members, we have, well, our operating budget, it's shifted a little bit partially because we have some pass-through grants that we, we um, manage, but we have about a $650,000 budget, I think, $600,000 budget. We have nine full-time staff, and we have, I think, a core of about 15 uh, seasonal instructors who teach bicycling, bicycle safety, kids programs. So our members make up a good chunk of our of our about one hundred fifty thousand dollars as membership and uh, ma some major donors who are members. We have a host of contracts. Uh, one of the things we've been working on organizationally, and I think this is a good tack for nonprofits generally, is to build your expertise on on certain things. So we're experts in bicycling. And we have experts in a variety of aspects, including the Safe Routes to School program and some other programs. And we've, we're, we're part of a number of teams, uh, including the Portland Safe Routes to School team, that competitively bid for um, contracts. So we're, uh, we basically manage, and we work with uh, Alta Consulting, um, and we help manage the Portland Safe Routes to School program and a variety of aspects. And we get about $100,000 a year from that. Uh, we have. We have contracts to provide technical service around the state for Safe Routes to School, and we're also looking to, we're hoping to be part of a, a national team to work on a national clearinghouse. So we've developed some expertise in areas that we actually have contracts. Uh, we do work with some other events like the, the Providence Bridge Pedal, uh, and oh, I think a couple other like the, uh, what is it, the, uh, the beer guys, who uh, the bicycle guys. Um, why am I? Oh, um, who is that? Why am I forgetting their names? You know, the, the bicycle men, I, they make, uh, well, anyway, I'll think of it in a second. They, they make, oh, Fat Tire, Pale, you know, those guys, uh, the Belgian Brewing, they, they put on an event every year. So when we work with, with those kinds of folks, they, they contribute money back to us when we help them. Uh, we have an annual fundraising gala event, which actually is in early March. You're all invited. Uh, there's $65 a ticket. But uh, we have at that uh, event, which is an awesome event, uh, it's being held at the Oregon Convention Center this year, because last year we were sold out, I think 450 people. We have an auction. and So we have a variety of funding sources. But one of the growing funding sources for us have been contracts. And I hope that we'll get additional contracts. And we're talking about trying to work uh, with other teams. We have a really good pulse on what bicyclists want. And I think it's more so than probably anyone else in the sense that we have a huge membership base. They'll, they come, they'll answer questions for us because they're really, they want to see better bicycling facilities. And so we're hoping to get involved in other types of urban planning projects uh, to help represent the voice of bicyclists. So a little background. Yeah. Um, I was having a discussion with several other women a couple nights ago um, about commuting and a lot of them stop commuting with the time change, but it's more a perception of uh, like neighborhood safety, sort mm -hmm. of depending on where they work and where they have to go from. And um, I know that's a really big issue, obviously, but I was wondering if um, that came up at, at all in terms of uh, problems that people saw, you know, reasons they didn't bike was m not car safety, but like personal safety in terms of uh, where they're biking and that kind of thing. Yeah, that, that came up in our survey. Uh, and we heard that, I think, probably more from women than from men. Um, and we heard that in some specific places. So like the Esplanade Trail or the OMSI, to, I mentioned this one already, but the OMSI to Selwood Trail, where it's basically, there are very, I think there's one access point from OMSI to Selwood, and it's like a three-mile trail. And some people don't feel safe riding that at night because there could be someone there. Uh, 
we we are sort of part of the Jane Jacobs fan club that basically talks about says eyes on the street. You know, if you can bike in a place where there are other people on the street, other bicyclists, uh, I think that improves the the perception of safety and probably the real safety as well. Because I think it's a, a perception issue in the sense of it's how you feel. Um, it's not necessarily that someone has actually been attacked because that's a whole different thing. But it's just like, okay, it's dark. I don't feel safe anymore. So um, we didn't put it in as one of our, say, our top four issues of how to improve bicycling. But I do think that if we had more people bicycling on you know, bicycle boulevards, designated bicycle ways, that people would generally feel safe on those types of environments. So I don't know if that's helpful. Um, you know, other than that, we also do think that more enforcement and more presence of community um, police is would really help bicycling. Bicyclists on, I mean, police officers on bicycles. That doesn't really improve the safety for bicyclists, but it does improve the safety of you moving through your neighborhood and feeling that you're going to have. So, so we also think those kinds of things. Anyone else? Yeah. <clears throat> What was the date that this report came out on? And could you speak to some of the successes uh, among the 40 projects? Yeah, thanks. I didn't go into the uh, our, really our campaigns much except for this low traffic campaign that we're really just rolling out. Uh, the project was released in September of 05, so it was still pretty fresh. And we're on sort of the tail end of our presentation schedule in our presentations. We'll be giving, I think, a couple more uh, one at Metro and one at the City of Portland, uh, City Hall. Um, right now, we have two really clear campaigns that came out of this work. I mean, some of the stuff we're already working on, like enforcement and safe routes to schools, which I mentioned a number of times, and some of the trail advocacy, we've already been working on, and those are existing campaigns. But this year, we're planning on rolling out two campaigns. One is to fix the Rose Quarter. Uh, so there's a big gap at the Rose Quarter, basically by the Rose Garden Arena, where you can't, there's really no good way to access the Esplanade, which is a huge entrance point to the bicycle system. Um, and the other is the Bicycle Boulevard campaign. Uh, the Rose Quarter is in process, and in fact, we've had a number of meetings with TriMet. They're really interested, and the city of Port, and so we're now kind of, they have a, a good a design, which is draft. Um, and it looks good. Uh, we're at some point going to publicly put it out there, you know, ask people to comment, get people engaged in that process. And we hope that by spring we, we could find the funding and build it. So I'm hoping that by this spring or summer we will have uh, legal access through the Rose Quarter. So that we think would be a great um, benefit for bicyclists. And then the other one, the, the, the Bicycle Boulevard campaign, we're still sort of rolling that out, but we're choosing bicycle boulevards in north and northeast Portland specifically. So we think that there's a whole host of bicyclists in north and northeast Portland who like to ride, and the facilities are okay, but they could be better. They just could be clear, they could be, and we're going to turn the stop signs, and we want to do like the whole thing. So um, we hope that in the next two years we'll have a couple of those and we're working really closely with the city of Portland and a variety of different processes that they have to, uh, to, to look at that. The city is actually, partially because we've been beating the drum and partially because they've gone into a pretty serious uh, research process with PSU actually. Uh, Chris, I think, has worked on this, uh, looking at the data about what people feel safe and where the crashes are and I'm not exactly sure, Chris, what part of the, the research you were worked on, but you could tell us if you want, actually. Yeah. Well, it's still sort of working on the work plan with, this, with the city for the CSTSP, but some of the, a couple of the grad students are here. One of the focus will be sort of this term on the driving under the influence and, uh, and on, we'll be doing some kind of best practices with uh, pet and bike safety. I know they've talked to you already, so. Great. Yeah, it's exciting. The city of Portland is really engaged, and they've engaged PSU, as you've just heard. 
Um, and one of the things that they've heard is kind of a, they, they have a similar belief right now that, as us, is low traffic streets. And so they have at least one bicycle boulevard in southeast Portland that they're looking at doing. I think it would be around the Powell area, going out to, I don't know, maybe as far as 90th or out in the 90s or further, perhaps. So we're supporting that, but we're really looking at trying to do a couple things in north and northeast Portland as well. So that's where we're at, um, you know, and we're hoping to make them public uh, as it goes for advocacy. The actual development of a campaign is a, we've found is a successful tool. So one thing, the Rose Quarter, or another thing, Bike Boulevard in North Portland, and, you know, and, and actually get people to support that campaign. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned Am Amsterdam as a kind of an inspiration, and I know that uh, vehicle speeds helps uh, promote bicycle commuting in Amsterdam. I'm wondering if you know anything about uh, commuting distance. Are they, are they commuting about the same distance as we are in Portland, or can you speak to that? Yeah, I'll try. I, you know, I have a whole Amsterdam thing that I didn't roll out here. But first of all, vehicle speed is a huge issue. And they've addressed it really vigorously. They have um, 20, what is it, 30K zones. So they have basically you know, higher speed routes, and then most of theirs are 30K zones. I think that's right, about 18 miles an hour. So where we have t neighborhood speeds of 25, they, their neighborhood speed is 18. And they really design. I mean, they, they go for it. In fact, we heard from one police officer in the Netherlands who said, we don't really enforce uh, against people who are speeding on streets that aren't designed for higher traffic speeds. So if you have a 30K street or 18 mile an hour street and one of them is like has a chicane in it and a speed bump and all this other stuff and another one is just a straight shot that they're going to choose the chicane traffic calm street to do their enforcement because they kind of realize I think that it, it, the how people behave is, is a lot of what the street looks like. Um, so they've taken on traffic speed. In fact, there are some folks in, in the Netherlands who want the traffic speed in neighborhoods to be 10 miles an hour. You know, of course, when you have 18 miles an hour, they say, oh, speed's still a problem. It needs to be 10. It needs to be 5. Um, getting to the other part of your question, or the real part of your question, uh, which was distance, uh, the, the picture I showed you of the bike racks uh, in the Netherlands that I could quickly f I could quickly just go to it. Um, that was this is by a train station in Amsterdam and this is a three or four story parking garage. It's free. There are thousands of bicyclists bicycles there and people every day ride to the train station from all over, park, and then take high-speed trains or interurban trains. You know, they have a huge, you know, of course, it's Europe with a big train system. And they take trains to nearby cities. And they actually commute decent distances. Many of them commute. And there's no room. There's no place to park your car. I mean, there's really, you don't drive to the train station. You bike to the train station. You take a train. And actually, some people have bikes on the other end, too. And they just leave them there overnight. Um, and everyone drives junkers, rides junkers, as you can see. So it's like if you're... If your $50 bike gets stolen, you don't really fret over it. Uh, so the distances that people commute, I think, are substantial. Um, the people, distance that people bike, it's unclear. Their cities are fairly compact. But more of the bicycling happens in the center, and less of it happens in the outskirts. And they still have 50% automobile mode. So I think that the longer commutes probably still are, you know, that are more suburbanist style, they probably are by car. Um, so I don't have the, an the, the right answer of what the distance is, but my sense is they might be riding, you know, it's possible to ride forever because uh, there's bike facilities everywhere, but they're probably riding a couple miles or five miles maybe, you know, but it's probably more like two or three miles to a train station, and then they're hopping on a train and going somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I saw his hand come up uh, earlier. Um. Riders to be more active or to consider biking and commuting more, you know, often. 
Yeah, that's um, that's a really great question. And besides, I'm going to look here. Um, the the last uh, in our document, the last sort of eleven projects or so, talk about programs and incentive campaigns and whatnot. The BTA has one of our biggest programs is called the Bike Commute Challenge, where it's a program where we try and get businesses to compete against other businesses. It's really a commute to work program. And then we have the school programs I was telling you about earlier. Um, and the BTA does some promotional work. We have a variety of, we have a couple workshops here and workshops there. and. Uh, there is a whole other set of bicycle advocacy and bicycle culture that also deals with this. So I mentioned things like the Providence Bridge Pedal, and there are all sorts of bike user groups, and there's other nonprofits besides the BTA. So I think the BTA probably could do some more in promotion um, than we do. Uh, the BTA also recognizes that there's a lot of bicycle culture stuff, especially in Portland. Um, so we let a lot of that go f to the other groups. We let the other groups handle, you know, I don't know, the week, you know, a lot of, the, there's just, in the summer, there's just so many bicycle rides that someone could go on. The city of Portland has a whole program. There's just, there's so many different things that we have limited our work on that. However, we really feel like there needs that ultimately there need to be some other incentive programs out there to get people to seriously consider bicycling, especially to work. So, for example, right now the federal government allows business owners and businesses to write off the cost of parking and transit passes, but not for incentives for bicyclists or walkers. So an employer could give you know, a free transit pass and get a tax write-off and up to $100, and a free parking space up to, I think, $175. But there's no similar thing for bicyclists. Um, you know, we think, so we, we think that there's possible to have some institutional incentives that could be offered. And in fact, in, in workplaces that do support bicycling with incentives, there are more people do choose them. So there are a, a very few number of places that give cash incentives or other incentives for bicyclists. And a lot of people, I mean, if you had the opportunity to say, well, you know, you either get free parking, a free bus pass, or 75 bucks, you know, people would say, huh, maybe I'll choose the 75 bucks. So that's, you know, that's a possibility. So, I, um, so that's, I mean, that's kind of where we're at. We do have, you know, we do, we support a, a variety of, of small things, and there are other groups that do stuff. I think ultimately institutional Work would be the most, the biggest bang for the buck. Um, there's some other hands. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at this pie chart for the user groups, and I was thinking that um, you might have left out people who were uh, economically constrained, so they were basically riding bikes because they had to. Is this something that the BPA just doesn't take on because it's not within their their range of of uh, projects, or is it something that some other group takes on so you guys don't address it? Yeah, um, there are some. I'll, I'll try and address a couple aspects of that question. Um, this specific chart, I th we were considering more about um, the kind of the comfort and desire of people. So it's not just the desire. It's not just whether you want to bike uh, per se, but it's kind of how you feel about bicycling. Now, I do think that it's possible that you have some people who are low income or who have DUIs and don't have driver's licenses anymore, whatever the situation is, um, who might be class group C cyclists. They don't really feel that comfortable biking, but they're kind of thrown into it anyway because they don't really have other options. And I think that there is some of that. There could be some of that. Um, we don't have any specific programs for low income people. Uh, although we do offer free workshops, commuting workshops, legal workshops, uh, and a couple, you know, we have brochures and some other information. And there are other groups. So we have a, a monthly, a bi-monthly legal clinic, and I think it's a bi-monthly uh, commuting workshop. In the winter, it's a winter commuting workshop. In the summer, it's just a regular commuting workshop. Uh, the Community Cycling Center, which is another nonprofit, actually has a grant through the the Jobs Access Reverse Commute Program, which is a federal transportation program 
that every state gets some money for, and they use that money to provide low-income people with bikes and with training. And there's some, I think you have to go through like a five-hour fixing a mechanical program so you understand the bike generally, you know, teaching you how to fish kind of a thing, and then you get a bike, and then I think you might have to also do some on-bike educational work before the program is complete. So uh, they do a nice job with that. That's a good program for them, and they get some federal funding for that. So those are some of the, the programs I know. I also know the city of Portland has, has some, they, each year they have a target area uh, that they work on to improve transportation access, and they worked on Lentz uh, last, last year, and they did North Portland, or maybe, maybe I don't know, they have worked on Lentz and North Portland, um, so they are looking at equity issues as well. Um, yeah. I just wondered, do you guys get involved in political debates such as whether bikes should be able to treat stop signs or uh, red lights as stop signs and those kind of you know, issues? Yeah, that, not only do we, I'm our lobbyist, I'm the BTA's lobbyist, um, thus the tie. Uh, we, uh, we are think, you know, th we, right now we're going through our, leg our process of defining our legislative campaign for 2007, for the 2007 legislative session. Oregon only has a biannual um, uh, legislative session. So last year, in 2005, we did actually pass two laws, one which was a safe routes to school thing, and another which did two things. It allowed bicyclists to pass legally on the right, which prior to 2006, it was illegal, it was legal to pass on the right in bicycle lanes, but not, not in bicycle lanes. So now you're allowed to do that safely. You can't I mean, if someone's taking a right and has their turn signal on, you can't pass them. And they, you know, uh, but if you know, if everyone's going straight and there's a line of cars and there's room to go through, you could do that. Also, we changed the law in bicycle lanes, allowing bicyclists to leave bicycle lanes legally. So there's actually no provision in the law before 2006 that allowed bicyclists. If there's glass in the bicycle lane and you went out into the roadway and then you got hit, one of the pieces that gets used against you is you weren't in the bicycle lane and there was one available. So um, we changed that. We uh, are working on a legislative package that a variety of issues we're looking at, including the rolling through stop signs, which came up in the 2003 session. It would have allowed bicyclists to basically treat a stop sign as a yield sign. And in fact, in the Netherlands, we only saw one stop sign. A group of, I think it was 10 of us, we saw one stop sign in a week with 10 people. It was all yield signs. And it's just the way that they, and, and if you think about it, yield, at least from a modeling standpoint, would work more efficiently than stop. If there was no, I mean, if you could have a system that was completely seamless, not having to stop, accelerate, decelerate, would work more efficiently. So they, they've chosen that system in the Netherlands, and partially because they have so many bicycles, I think. So yes, we have a lobbying program. If you want to find out more, you can grab one of my cards, or I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, we may have time for, I think there are two more, so we'll just add, do those two and then we'll have to wrap it. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, winter commuting workshops. So I guess that's to deal with issues of inclement weather and kind of things like that. What kind of things can you recommend? It seems like a, a huge obstacle. Um, well, I could give you a one minute on it, and uh, which, or maybe, how about this? I'll take the other question, and then I'll answer that, and whatever time left, I'll go over winter commuting stuff. Yeah. I was wondering, as far as driver behavior, if you noticed in the Netherlands, I'm just assuming that their um, driver education system is maybe a little bit more intricate. Um, and I'm wondering if that reflects positively in areas that are like high car traffic, and if, if that can be proven maybe so that in the U.S. we can increase that. Right? Yeah. Well, I'll give you also a one-minute framework so I have answer, time to answer both questions. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, first of all, you can't drive till you're 18, which is the case in New York City, but not most places in the U.S. So, A, they're older. And, you know, like many European countries, they've already been, been able to drink since they were 16. So they're not, one of the things is that they're not necessarily dealing with, like, the kind of DUI issues after the fact. But that's another story. Um, so not only is it 18, but you have to go through a mandatory driver's education program that costs between three and four thousand dollars. So many people, especially people who live in Q 
communities where you may as well be biking anyway, um, or you're, you know, you're a college student and you live near the college town, just don't even get their license until they're a professional, until they need to, you know, until they're done with college kind of a thing. So it's, um, and everyone, you know, a lot of people go to, I mean, it's, they get free public education there. So most people are in college and something like that until they're 22 or something. So they, they just have a shift in who has cars and who drives cars there. And I'm sure a mandatory education course that costs a couple of grand to take would help. Yes, would help. And they also, they have in-school education starting at like the second grade where they get 30 minutes a week every week for their whole entire educational program on bicycle safety, pedestrian safety. So it's pretty extensive and yes, um, it, it has positive impacts. So um, on winter commuting, do we have like two more minutes for that? Sure. Yeah? Okay. On, on winter commuting, just two minutes. Um, well, the, first of all, there are a lot of different decisions that you can make and ways to do it uh, and money you can spend as well. I mean, the first thing you have to do for winter commuting is get fenders. The absolute first thing. If you're going to ride in the rain, you need fenders because otherwise, I mean, you could ride in rain gear. Like you could just put on a rubber suit and then call it good and you're fine, you know, but you need fenders so you're, you don't get the splash up from the street. So then if the road's wet and it's not raining, you're fine. The next thing you need are lights because it gets dark early and doesn't get dark until late. So you need lights and, and you know, that can be a little bit spendy depending on, you know, what kind of lights you're looking at. And, uh, and I would recommend, you know, like a rear light, like a three or five LED light at least. Some people get two. That's less expensive. A front light, they start at, good ones start at 25 bucks and they go up to 200. Um, I personally don't wear rain gear. I just, uh, I usually have a change of clothes. Like, um, this is my, I can't, sorry folks in the internet, you can't see this? You're probably off anyway by now. This is my rain jacket. This is my jacket. It's wool. Um, this is what I wear and it's, Cool, you know, I can. It, I I get really sweaty, so if I go with rain gear, I may as well be rained on anyway. Um, I just I don't even bother with rain gear. And then, this is let's see, I'm carrying around this. So sometimes I do look like a hobo even when I'm wearing a suit. And then I have a pair of wool trousers that um, I can pull over. Good pants. So if it's raining out right now, I'll just pull these over, and I stay cool. Um, and they, you know, I wear these for a week and then I wash them and these are basically just my bicycling or yard pants or whatever on the weekend and then, um, and then I, I do have a, a pair of shoes I tend to bicycle in, they're kind of boots. So in my office, I have a couple of pairs of shoes, um, you know, although up here I, I wore my office, my work shoes. So that, that's what I do. Other people put on full rain gear and they have rain booties and rain pants and stuff and I just, because I get really sweaty fast, I don't do that. Um, and then there are a variety of, of pannier, like bags you can get, and there's some that are waterproof. I got some from, um, from Holland or from the Netherlands that I got in a garage sale or a flea market for 15 bucks, and they're, they're waterproof. They're cotton with um, you know, sealed cotton. Um, some people get German, the Ortlieb, or other style bags that are waterproof. Um, so that you, there's a certain amount you can go up to and spend. It sort of depends. You could throw your stuff in a plastic bag and just throw it in your backpack. So it depends on how much you're riding every day, but fenders for sure, lights for sure, and then from there, you're sort of, and gloves, you know, hats. All right, well, thank you guys. I appreciate folks who stayed around. Thank you, and I'll, yeah. um, next week, you can check online, our speaker is gonna be another alum, actually, Mike Rose, who's at Alta Planning and Design, is gonna be talking about trail, bike head trail design and interesting projects. But anyway.